He's, 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 he's in the hole. Tyler. Tyler. Tyler's not on here. Bill Hill. <laughs> you got Paul here, right? Hopefully well, you guys told him I was here. Yes. <coughs> Jennifer. Here. Okay, good. Carly. <laughs> Is this our class Lucy rank, Carly's I guess? Here. There you go. I want to order a class rank, Lucy. so I'm at the bottom. Lucy, no, Lacey. 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 Hey, we have a billion. Lacey. Lacey. I'm sorry. <laughs> And you know, I have the paper where you scratched it out and corrected it. I was about to say, yeah. That's your new name. It's not like that's the first time it happened in your life. That's correct. Scott. Scott's not here. Elizabeth. Here. Jonathan. Here. Bobby Goins. Here. Matt. Here. Larissa. Here. Michael Sand here. Oh, that makes sense. Joe. Yep. Rocky. Rocky's not, not here. here. He's not here. Dane. Here. Jeremy. Here. All right. Good deal. <coughs> There's Tyler. Tyler's here. Tyler is here. Woohoo! Yeah, Tyler. Here. <laughs> Jake. We can get started now. There we go. Okay. <coughs> So here's the situation. We have time for book reports today. Does anybody have a video for today? Next week. Next week you'll be. I, I hope not next week. I want to hear next week. Yeah. I hope you're all ready that day because <laughs> that's it. Uh, my plan right now <clears throat> is to put the final exam out there uh, the weekend of Thanksgiving, which is next weekend, and that gives you to the what the, the ninth to get that back to me. So uh, you get it back to me, I'll get it graded, I'll get the uh, grades reported. Uh, who has book reports today? I think we have one, two, hope we have five or six, three, four, five. Okay, good, good, because we need. If you want a video, one of our partners is missing. He kind of wanted to wait to come back, but. That's, yeah, it's done. We just. Only reason we didn't want to do it was because Rocky wasn't here and he wanted okay. to be here when we did it. But. Okay. All right. Well, we can do it if you're ready. All right. I'm ready. Let's let's, let's see where we are time wise. We might we might okay. want to do that. I, and uh, does anybody else have a video? <laughs> no, I, sort of. I have a question. No, the, when, are the, when is the project group project analysis due? Yeah. When when you do the video? So December second. Yes. It, it, the sooner you get it to me, the sooner I'll get it graded. So if you've got it, and, and I did get a couple of questions this week about uh, about those reports too. I'm looking for something that's like eight to ten pages, right? I know you can't do everything that's in the project management plan requirements in that amount of time. I also know you can't do the subset of what I asked you. So so don't think you have to do all of it, one. Then I gave you a subset in the in the assignment. I also understand that you could spread that out and make that really, really long and do a lot of, lot of work. My intent is to make sure you understand how to apply the body of knowledge to a project. All right, that's what I'm asking you to show me. So, uh, Eight to ten pages is my level of expectation. If it's a work thing and it really helps you to go over and above because you're going to have to do that for work, fine. All right? Knock yourself out. That's not what's required for to meet the requirements for the assignment. Okay? Any comments? <laughs> what I want to do today uh, is we have two sections we haven't been through. What I'd like to do, depending on how much time we've got, is I would like to show you those and say, here are the main points in this section that I want to make sure you you get, right? I'm assuming at this point that you guys are all comfortable with knowledge areas and processes and process groups and how the body of knowledge all fits together. I'm also assuming, based on what I've seen today, that if you had to start a project today, you understand where to find the outline for the project management plan, what all the components are, you understand that you'd have to go 
look at those and say, okay, here are the inputs. What, what is it I'm trying to produce here? And there are how many elements to a project management plan? 16. And, they, and you know where they come out of, right? You can go find them in the knowledge areas and say, okay, if I had to produce a communications plan, you could go do that. You know what kind of things you would gather up to do that. Is, it, is everybody comfortable with what I'm saying? The, the point of this is to say, I want you to end up at the end of this semester being able to use this material, right? Not just pass a test. And, and I got reasonably comfortable after the midterm that, okay, you guys have put in some extra time, which would be required to get to where you can use the material, and most of you are comfortable with that. All right? So, so for the final, <clears throat> excuse me, for the final exam, it's kind of pulling the pieces and parts together. The te test is going to look a lot like the midterm did. I'll try to make it a little bit more, a little bit more concise since... Some of you said it was more than a 90-minute exam. Okay? Okay? Everybody comfortable with what we're going to do today then? <clears throat> All right, I want to get through. Uh, I think now I have everybody's book report, right? I, no. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Everyone who has done an oral book report has sent me your written report, right? Yes. I got yours. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so, so if you've spoken... I have your written, and unless you tell me, not me, there are some of them I want to submit for, you know, potential use in the uh, uh, ASEM practice periodic. Now, if you tell me don't, I won't. But unless you tell me don't, I, now that doesn't mean they'll get published. But the last time I think I submitted six of them, and three of them got used over the course of the next year. So. Okay, everybody. And I'm talking about the book summaries now, right? I feel like I'm jumping around all over the place, but everybody knows what piece I'm talking about. Okay. All right. <clears throat> then if it's, if it's all right with you, I'd like to do a couple of, or have you guys do uh, a couple or three of the book reports. Then we'll walk through uh, a couple of these sets of slides <clears throat> just so I can point out to you for the test, here's what... Here's what I'm going to be focused on. And for the ethics piece, <clears throat> we're, we're going to walk through that. But I'll tell you now, if you decide to take the PMP exam, there will be some things on there about the ethics piece. That's something that PMI emphasizes. So if you understand how it's organized and you've got a good set of slides here for studying that piece of it, you'll be ready for that. For the test, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what to kind of focus on. And then from the procurement piece, we'll, we'll walk through that because there's some really good practical stuff in that section. But again, you've got a good set of slides now, and we're not going to spend time talking about inputs, outputs, tools, and techniques. Okay? Any comments, questions? Yes. Um, I'd ask you to go over some of the multiple choice. Yeah, and I meant to post that on there because there was number seven was one. Do you have that? Because I didn't bring my copy of the exam back. Does somebody have their final exam? Yeah. <laughs> there was a question. I think it was, yeah, it was number seven. Organizational process, is, is this one of the two that you had asked about? The organizational process assets are primarily internal to the project and include culture and structure. So the intent of that was to remind us that OPAs are primarily internal and enterprise environmental environmental factors are primarily external. Apparently I put an answer on there that I think it was D. The most important part of scope planning since OPAs are used in planning. My intent there to say was was to say OPAs are not the most important part of planning. They are a part of planning. But a lot of you chose D there. So does anybody have a comment or, or justification for why you went that space? I wanted, that I wanted to choose A, and I initially did when I first saw it until the, I read the last half of the sentence that says culture. including culture and that kind of stuff, which is typically in EF, EF, EEF. That's why. 
I actually so chose it as my it. second answer because it was the best next answer. Okay. And the same, yes, same, same, same thing there. Because okay. several, uh, looking at the book, it actually says organization charts are EEFs. Yeah, so yeah, it's like, uh, so that makes that not a true statement. Okay. All right. So, so I, I, I messed up there or, or at, a, at a minimum confused it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And so Sorry. when I went through that, I thought, well, this is interesting because I probably a third of you or so yeah. went to D. So I felt like every answer had something that was wrong with it. So it was like it didn't matter what I was going to pick, I was going to get it wrong. Right. Okay. I just crossed yeah. out the wrong part when you turned on your headache. <laughs> I, I did. I did. Oh, you did. Okay. All right. If you want those, I will make that change, right? So yeah. if you'll send me a note. I, I do. <laughs> you do. Okay. I, I will make that change. Uh, <laughs> all right. Unless it's going to be review, mean you review the whole. Yeah, I'm going to review the whole <laughs> exam. <laughs> on that one, I won't. I heard that. I remember that. On like, that question, I promise all. And you know, when I was grading that thing, I had one of those thoughts about, you know, well, this is this is really weird because so many people are doing that, and so. Some of anyway. those times, if you read the first half of it and just answered and moved on. That's actually what I did originally, and I went back and thought, oh man, I've got this wrong. Yeah, okay, I, I messed up there. There was another yeah. question you asked about. Do you remember what it was? Uh, I, I did spend a lot of time trying to figure out what K-I-T-A was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I was like, man, I must have missed that. I don't know what that means. And, and you know, I know we talked, does everybody know what that is now? No. We talked about that as part of the HR piece. KIT KITA comes under the motivational theories, and it's a call. It's a kick in the pants. Oh, right. I not know that. No, so, I'm not military. So I, that was not the right answer on that right. particular. I'm question. just afraid because I didn't know what it meant. <laughs> so, what do you get if you Google KITA? I'm sure there's a whole lot of uh, other acronyms that are, there, that, that, that are not yeah, kicking the pants. Yeah, I tried. <laughs> okay, well. KITA. So, so normally in the EM stuff where that comes up is you start talking about motivational theories and you say, you know, routinely there's the carrot and the stick to stuff. That's what we've been taught forever and ever and ever is you either, you know, motivate people with a carrot or are you motivate them with a stick and the stick is the kick in the pants. So, so anyway, I'll remember that too. All right, if I'm gonna use that acronym, I will at least define it before. It's, it's a, from a Japanese reference of it has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> not it. <laughs> That's right. Or the dictionary says it's the most beautiful person on this earth. <laughs> <laughs> Now you know why I was confused. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you learned something new today, right? Everybody knows what key, key that is, right? Okay, who wants to be uh, the first presenter today? All right. Fire away. I'll be clear. All right. Um, the book I chose to read was Systems Thinking for Business. You will not find this currently on the... Uh, top 25 list, I, um, I asked to get an exception and, and uh, read this book. Uh, the reason I chose to read it was because uh, I read the Thinking and Systems book pretty quickly and um, was kind of thirsting for a little bit more. That was really a qualitative analysis and I, I did some, uh, some research and, and read some reviews from other folks and they said that this book not only uh, talked about the qualitative aspects but also added some quantitative aspects of being a numbers junkie. Uh, that, that's what, what uh, spurred me to read this. Um, a warning about it, it's not um, psycho babble like Bill says. It's, mm -hmm. it's not a feel good book. It's not, a, um, it's not one of those things that's gonna make you go out and wanna coach a high school football team or anything like that. But um, it is a book, like I said, of, um, of theories, measures, um, examples from the real world. And, um, and it also has a similar goal that you have with the project management class where um, at the end of each chapter, at the end of each topic, 
it mentions for further reading on this particular subject, these are books you need to have in your library. So um, if you found one particular topic interesting, um, there's suggestions to take it further. Um, for the project manager, um, there, are, uh, there are quite a few areas that this book hits. Uh, communications management, HR management, leadership, and planning. Um, three sections of the book in particular. He's got a chapter on strategic behaviors where he talks about uh, game theory, which I had not learned about before, but I thought was really interesting, where um, the example he uses is a prisoner's dilemma. Everyone has a reward or a consequence for their decision, so you and your buddy commit a crime, you're separated. If you both keep your mouth shut, then you'll both get a year in jail. If one person blabs, then that person will get out of, you know, the person who reveals the truth will get um, get released, but the other person will go to jail for two years. And if they both tell on each other, then they both get two years. So, um, it reasons through how people make, make decisions and understanding that there's consequences and rewards, and if you can understand those, then you can predict people's, um, the way they think strategically. Um, the second part I thought was very applicable to project management was um, understanding the networks. Uh, he does a, a good job of showing some uh, modeling software tools that you can use to model networks and nodes and, and um, some of the similar um, equations that we see in the PMBOK about you know, communication channels and things like that. And then it also talks about um, multiple perspectives. Um, it says that um, if you're going to be a strategic thinker, um, you should think about things in terms of three levels. He calls it TOP, the, how people make decisions based on technical information, how they make decisions that benefit an organization, and how you make decisions benefiting yourself personally. If you can understand those perspectives, it'll uh, make you a more effective manager. If you don't read this for a, as a, from the program management side, from a system engineering standpoint, there's obviously um, a lot of benefits to it. It does talk about optimization, which um, we're all pretty intimate with right now after last semester. But um, I thought it did a good job of explaining. Um, it, it, it'll map out kind of the optimization process and the theories behind it in a, a three-dimensional grid. and and talks about you know where we're finding maximums and how there are local maximums even within a, um, you know a group of decisions. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, it talks about some, uh, an example they call forging ants, which it, it links back to strategic behaviors, but it's a modeling software where um, people can move on a grid and. and it, it tries to basically help you understand the reason, how people are going to move through networks and how they're going to make decisions. It, it uses ants, like an ant colony, and they'll place food at different places and, and how they move to get that food and bring it back to their colony and things like that. And it also talks a lot about prediction modeling, which um, uh, we read a little bit about in the fifth discipline. I think with one of the oil companies. I can't remember which one. Um, but it's another area that I'd like to learn more about. Um, I started my review asking these two questions. Uh, have you ever been frustrated after thinking you've solved a pressing business problem only to realize that you just plugged a hole in a much larger issue? And do you find that you have trouble identifying interconnections between processes or don't always think of the uh, networks linked in communication? Um, if you answered yes to any of those questions, then I would definitely recommend this book. I think it gives, like I said, a good qualitative and quantitative approach to a lot of the problems we all face in our careers and it gives you um, a lot of paths to learn more about a particular area um, to build your library. Okay. And you recommend it then? I do recommend it, yeah. All right. uh, <clears throat> the, the systems engineering book that you guys had to read, I think it was uh, Donella Meadows. Yeah. Thinking that in system? Systems. Yeah, Thinking in Systems. And you probably have been told then that there's a connection between that group and then Seengate, or however you pronounce his name, who wrote the fifth discipline? You know they were part of the same group. They're all MIT. Are they? Do you know MIT. if, if this he was? He did not come out of MIT. He's okay. actually a professor at uh, Portland State, I believe. Um, so his background is in electrical engineering, and then he he did get his PhD in systems sciences. So, um, but he did not come from the MIT group. Okay. 
But he worked he worked at Intel, and so a lot of his real world examples come out of Intel and the technology industry, like Google. Very good. He talks about their prediction modeling group and things like that. And did you already send me that? Uh, your your written up idea so okay. last night. Yeah, I think I, I thought I saw that. Uh, one of the comments you made there that that I've heard people say something similar similar, but it really resonated with me is when you start asking the question, <clears throat> am I trying to deal with a symptom or am I trying to fix a system? That helps me think, okay, am, am I looking at the right situation? Am I trying to solve the right problem? Or am I just trying to make my temperature go down? You know, am I trying to, to heal the, the disease I have or do I just want to not be so dang hot? So uh, I think that's applicable in business. And we see it all the time. One of my favorite examples has been what has been going on and it continues to go on in the healthcare industry. You know, we've been having these huge battles for a decade now and discussions and arguments about how to fix the health insurance situation. Well, it's not about fixing the health insurance situation. It's the health care system that at its core is about the provider and the patient. But that's not the conversation we're having. We're having a conversation about fixing health insurance. Well, personal opinion, we're having the wrong conversation, and we'll continue to have the wrong conversation as long as we talk about making sure everybody has health insurance. Right? No, we need to make sure everybody has access to quality health care. That's a different question, and you might get a different answer. And I've probably already said <laughs> it, that to you all a hundred times, but that, that just bugs the hound out of me. <clears throat> okay. Nicely done, and I've got everything that I need from you. Any, any questions, comments? So who was the author again? Rich Jolly. Jolly? Yep. And, and the reference to your professional library, you know, get your bonus points. <laughs> if you mention that your work. This is a part of my new project management <laughs> library. Yeah. Okay. Somebody over here. I can do mine. Quickly. We've already we've already seen mine, so this is going to be kind of like a repeat. Maybe better, maybe worse. I don't know. <laughs> so I don't have a book because I didn't actually buy it. I just downloaded it. Um, so I did uh, the five dysfunctions of a team: a leadership fail by leadership fable by Pat Lencioni. Um I chose it primarily because of the word dysfunction. I it, it just resonated with me. I'm like, well, that's got to be good. I mean, where do you go from there? And luckily for me, uh, the fact that the fable part of the title tells you kind of the way it's going. It's, it's not real. It's a, it's a fictional story about a fictional company that is doing okay. You know, they've got a product. It's working well. However, they do have problems meeting, meeting their design, to, you know, their, their, their goals of market share. they got problems internally with turnover. So it's probably where a lot of companies are. Uh, the, the, the background, or, or basically the story goes, bring in a new president to try to try to you know, control the company, wrap it up, try to figure out what their problems are and move forward. She is brought in outside of the tech business as a tech company. Um, so she doesn't know anything about what's going on, what they do, what their product is, but she does understand uh, team building, motivating people and whatnot. Uh, so she comes into the company, she kind of watches a little bit, you know, doesn't really do anything for a while, then immediately, well not immediately, after about a month or two, she establishes some retreats for the leadership team. That's, and that's another important part that I kind of focused on. We're really only talking about the core leadership team of this company. We don't really get into kind of where we are, whether middle or lower management or even down on the floor working. Which, you know, maybe, maybe you can translate the book into some of that, maybe you can, it's hard to say, it depends on the company, obviously. So, so we're talking about the core leadership of this, this company, and one of the important things in the book is she immediately had buy-in from the board that she could make changes that were drastic. You know, they agreed that she had control. And that's important because some people left. Because her, her vision on how to build the teams didn't, didn't go with how they envisioned their job. Um, Everybody in, the, everybody in the leadership team was working their best to do what they thought was a good job. The problem is they were kind of working against each other at times. Uh, and the book is written about five dysfunctions. 
absence of trust would be the core dysfunction. You can't really go, can't really do anything else if you don't have the trust. And this isn't really just like, you know, hey, I trust you're going to do your job. This is, if I have a weakness, are you going to, I trust that you're not going to belittle me, kind of, kind of trust. Uh, you know, you could, you kind of look at it like it might be better. Well, like, for instance, I don't care if you belittle me, so I don't really need that. However, a lot of people don't have that ability. So with, with this trust in your coworkers, you can go up to the next dysfunction and try to control that or, or deal with it, which is fear of conflict. Um, and that's so if, if you trust that your, your coworkers are, are, are gonna, gonna treat you respectfully, now you can, now you can go head to head with them on things that are important to you. You can say, I don't agree with you, we can have a discussion, we can work it out and move on. Uh, if you can get past that level, the next dysfunction is lack of commitment. And this is really committed to the goal of the company, not necessarily your goals, your personal goals, like paying a mortgage. Um, the commitment we're talking here is can you, can you actually commit completely to the goal of the company? And you've got to be able to understand it too, right, which is one of the things. Uh, we go up to the next one is avoidance of accountability. And it starts getting a little bit harder to understand exactly what they're talking about here, but, but this is, uh, you know, give you an idea. To, to address this, the teammates must hold each other accountable to the group decisions and vision. So you're relying on your other people to say, hey, you're, you're going off base here. We need, to, uh, we need to pull you in at this point. And then the last one is inattention to results. Um, and this is really focusing the entire team on the success of the project. And, and when these things break down, what you end up with is a lot of people doing their own thing. They might be trying to get to the end goal, but you end up with people like, well, I gotta pay my mortgage, I'm gonna do my job and go home, rather than, you know, can we make a hard decision and get this company going in the right direction? Um, and that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, I think it's a good book to read, it's easy to read. If you, if you like fictional books, it's great. You know, you can do it in a couple days, no problem. It has some good things to look at. I made a comment in my report that I don't think Y12 or a government lab might be the right place for some of this because we don't have a control over who's on our team. You know, I can't look, if I'm a manager, I can't look at you and say, you go home today, get out of here. Right, you're not, you're not picking up the, the, the president of this company had that control and so she sent some people off, they left. And that's where things might get a little sticky. You know, you might have uh, some good tools in here though. Myers-Briggs is a good one, you know, she used Myers-Briggs, so you can kind of understand people's personalities and work within that. So, I'd recommend it. I wouldn't, wouldn't put a lot of, uh, I'm gonna say, I wouldn't put a lot of faith that's gonna help you necessarily in some of our situations, but it's good to read, obviously. And the nice thing is, it's, it's not really dated, even though it's 16 years old now, it's not really dated because there's nothing, there's no, you know, there's no facts in it that are tying to this company or that company, so it's good. So probably useful to have yeah, in your it is. It's in good. your library, and, and it's easy, you know. So you know, you don't waste a lot of time, you know, even if you don't like it. And the relationship to PM. Well, let's see. What box. did I call out? So yeah, I found some 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 relationships here. Uh, I figured, okay, so the project human resource management, obviously, because we're dealing with people, we're dealing with teams, and how do you work with them? Um, Specifically, developing your team if you have a choice of who you get, you can, it can kind of help you find those those folks that are going to buy into everything, uh, and then manage the team, obviously, because that's what we're talking about. Um, and then project communication management. Uh, obviously, we need to communicate with people. We need to communicate what the goals of the company are and, and how they need to how they need to work to meet that. Um, and then project integration management. So. Directing the work and then monitoring the work. Okay. Are areas where, where it would come in handy. Any comments or questions? <laughs> there are a couple of thoughts that come to mind there that the relationship between what's going on there and the culture of the organization comes out in that country. You're, you're either assuming something about the culture or assuming I want to make some changes in the culture when you start to talk about trust and. Mm -hmm. And then being able to, there's, there's a book, did anybody do, uh, gosh, what's it called? Fierce Conversations? Anybody do that? Okay. Well, we won't. Uh, but, but that whole concept comes into that space and being able to, to, 
you know, be honest and, and open and <clears throat> say what needs to be said when. And so, uh, so that's worthwhile. Another thought you made me think about is <coughs> let's learn something else today. <coughs> How do you say that? Everybody's familiar with a Likert scale, right? When you do surveys, it's one through five, and you pick up the right, you and right. You, you've heard that. Well, according to my mentor, this you haven't heard of that. No. Okay, so when you when you take a lot of these tests where they say, or even surveys where they say. You know, always and never. Yeah. And they give you five yeah, yeah, yeah. or love it. Hey, that's our HRP test. Hate it. <laughs> <laughs> agree, yeah. Strongly disagree, strongly agree. And you have like five choices. Well, those are called Likert scales. You may not have heard it. Well, according to my mentor, this guy called, pronounced his name Likert. So those are liquor scales. So we we learned something new. But why why does that relate to what was just said? Some of the research that liquor did had to do with the concept he called liquor's linking pins. So what he did is he said that for organizations to be successful in communicating and successful in changing cultures you needed to establish teams, and those teams needed to be linked to other parts of the organization. <coughs> so if you have a management team, like she defined here, one of the issues you define, identified was the problem with how, you know, okay, yeah, we can change things at this level, but we really don't have any impact. Where am I getting alluded? Right, and, and, and we've seen that in, in, in communication theory, right? You start up here with a message, and by the time you go through three levels, you've got less than 25% of the message gets really to the third level. That's the you know, standard communication theory. So, so that's another thing he talked about is if you use this concept, for then... You can use it, it will positively impact communication and it will positively impact uh, culture change because this team, if it becomes a healthy team, and like you were, right, then the people that are on that team will develop similar teams that are healthy and communicate and have those, the, the opposite of the uh, attributes that you identified in that book. So. So interesting. If you, if you didn't learn anything else, learn that he's pronounced liquor. Okay. All right. It's improper English. <laughs> What's it? It's improper English. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <coughs> but if it's his name, he can right. Like this, like was Singe. I don't know how he really pronounces his name. Uh, somebody could Google that too, but I'm certain I've mispronounced it for however long it's been out. Somebody else have a book? Yeah. I read uh, <laughs> yeah. I read the last and uh, this is by Collins, James Collins. And uh, I did like the book. I found it very repetitive as it went through it repeated the same story in a different way each time, which builds on your communication schedule there. So you saw that as somewhat positive, right? Yeah, <laughs> where <laughs> or he had a word limit that he needed to get to. Right. He was writing a thesis and so kind of thinking of the past. Uh, I liked it because it was kind of a history book and it went back to older companies that were at least 50 years old. So anything built at this time was before 1945. And he compared uh, blue chip companies that we, we see now, like GE to Westinghouse, 3M to Norton, which probably a lot of people don't know unless they're in the grinding business. Um, and then uh, so it talks about how they it's, like I said, it's like a history book in, in a way of the research. So it talks about how Marriott started as a hot dog stand. And now look at it, it's one of the largest hotel chains. And it compares with them to Howard Johnson, who at the time was a huge, huge company for hotels. Um, 
then he goes through and he talks about uh, the 12 myths that people believe in companies, how they get started, how you have to have a good product to start a company. And he debunks, he debunks those myths through uh, the history of some of the companies. Like 3M was a failed mining company when they started. So, but through the process, what he talks about in here is through different processes, they, they become a leader in different industries. And I, I realize I'm all over the place, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, then he goes on to say that uh, the good foundation is uh, being a time teller, a clock builder instead of a time teller. So you want to build a process instead of just solving problems. So he talks about how uh, HP built an engineering department instead of a product. So they went through the process of how developing structure in their system, they were able to achieve over time. So um, where uh, they compare HP to Texas Instruments in this book, where Texas Instruments had a great product that they sold. HP had to develop products as they went along and they had the core to be that. Uh, which brings me back to the core development. So they say a good visionary company compared to a blue, good blue chip company has a solid core of the belief that they stay with. And Disney's is made to make people happy. So over time, Disney developed multiple different products, but they stayed true to their core of trying to make people happy. So that's why they developed Disney World and all of that. Right? Uh, and then they talk about uh, how great companies, or visionary companies, had uh, big, hairy, audacious goals. And they go on to explain how Boeing at the time was in combat with uh, McDonnell Douglas. And Boeing went out on a limb to create the first commercial airline when there was no demand for it. They, they decided that they wanted to go into the commercial airline industry before any demand. So they built the 707 and put them years ahead of McDonnell Douglas that had to play catch up. Um, and then they go on to uh, leadership and management and they talk about how GE develops CEOs from within instead of stepping outside and trying to bring in leadership from the outside. They build the core leadership from inside and they can innovate change through internal by developing people in the right mindset that have the core understanding of the company and, and teacher science. And then he talks about cult cultures. Great companies have a cult culture inside where everybody buys into the belief. Uh, Nordstrom retail, right? They, they believe the customer first, anything for the customer. And they talk about how a salesman on the floor, if you don't fully believe that the customer's first, you'll get rooted out over time. So you either buy in or you're gone. And that's how they say Disney is and Nordstrom. So if, if you don't fully buy into the belief, you'll be pushed out to the side. So your, your human resources, it's pretty simple. You just bring the people in, let them get trained on the floor, and they'll, they'll weed themselves out. Um, and then they talk about the concept of Try a lot of things, keep what works, throw the rest away. And that goes back to 3M. 3M gives uh, their employees 15% of their time to work on anything that they think is going to bring value to the market. So that's 15% of your own free time at work to work on a project that you truly have fully done. So, so then uh, I went back to what relates to project management in my report. Uh, communications, it repeats itself a lot. And it talks about uh, the core, making sure people understand your core beliefs and, and where the company stands. Uh, leadership, like I talked about GE, build from within, become and resource, human resources, back to uh, Nordstrom's and Disney, where you have a core culture that it develops itself. Uh, quality, uh, management. I go back to Sony, who started as a Japanese company in the time when uh, Japan was known for poor quality electronics. And uh, he decided he wanted to change the name of Japan for the 
the concept of Japan's electronics to be world known quality related. And uh, Sony actually started uh, with uh, rice cookers and he failed multiple projects or multiple products before he actually sold some equipment to Disney to work on Fantasia. And that's when he started actually making money. And then uh, risk analysis, I went back to Bowen and McDonald, uh, who uh, they took a great risk by jumping into the commercial airline industry, or the building commercial airlines. So, so again, I liked it because I, I, kinda, I like history. I like going back to the roots. Um, but very repetitive at the end. So. You recommend it or no? I would. I'd recommend it if you, you if you like to go back and see where these companies started, you know, like where Ford got his ideas and a few other companies. He used, uh, anybody have any questions or comments, feedback? He used the expression cult culture. How would you apply that to a project? Then what? Yeah, and see, I would even want to say it's stronger than that. That's the concept, right, right? But I would want to say you want your project team so committed to that 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 becomes priority. That becomes, you know, it's we have to do this. We have to be successful. We have to get it done. Right? Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Th you yeah. think about them all committing suicide. That's, I mean, I... Right, They're, they so believe in whatever the product is that they want to that they'd be willing to take their money. Yeah, and, and that's probably a, over the line. <laughs> <laughs> but that that's exactly the point about that's it. That's why you think of the cults. Yeah, when you you know I am committed to this. Now, so so I'm trying to apply that concept to project management. You know, we are going to be on time. We are going to get this done. We are going to implement this technology we, you know it's just just that kind of we're in this together it's us against the world kind of thing and have you been on those projects where it's a there's a different feeling there's a there's a, a different uh, relationship between the participants when you really get to that point where we're all in this together so uh, you know that that's one of the things that, that that makes me think about when you think about what made these companies successful over a long period of time? There was something about the culture and the, and the, the we're in this together kind of an attitude. Okay? Do I have I yours? Okay, yeah. I, 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 okay. <laughs> Somebody else over here? All right, fire away. Um, the book I chose is not on the list. It was a, a Heath Brother book, Decisive. There was, I think, Made a Stick. Right. There was, um, and I've read one or two other their books, so I was I was keen to read this one. I don't have it with me because I went it to somebody else at so work, um, so I do recommend it. But um, they do have some psycho babble kind of <laughs> talk in the beginning, um, which they tend to do with most of their books uh, that I've read. However, um, they tie it in pretty quick with a lot of anecdotal stuff. Um, that's actually real world basically the like case studies. But they, they approach this book with the notion that there's there's four commonplace villains to this decision making. And it's uh, narrow framing, confirmation bias, uh, short term emotion and overconfidence about how the future unfolds. Um, and so as they go through and kind of talk about examples of how decisions go awry and how some have gone good, um, they help kind of lay out this uh, this path for making good decisions, and one of those is, I guess, having the the impression that okay, I at this point I need to make a decision. A lot of times we're on autopilot, and so they cite like Daniel uh, came in, uh, his research on decision thinking that in our our mindset about the world, uh, we rarely feel that we are stumped. All right, we, have, we have this information readily available in mind. We quickly form opinions based on whatever is presented to us. Um, and so one sort of approach for dealing with this is they suggest the setting the tripwires, what they call them. And their example of that was uh, Van Halen. So in the 80s, you know, Van Halen's huge 
bands are bringing a lot of equipment into smaller venues. Is one of the first big bands to do this, like nine semi trucks full of equipment. Um, and so they needed a way to make sure that the venues had read the contract that they they were very detailed about what sort of safety things they needed and the like the requirements they had for for doing their shows. Um, so buried in the contract is this sort of eccentric rock star uh, edict that there will be. But they up front they ask for brown or M&Ms backstage, just a weird like thing, right? But deep inside the contract it says no brown M&Ms backstage, upon penalty of forfeiture, and you pay it for the entire show. So as soon as they get backstage, they see whether or not these guys actually read the contract and understand it. Um, so pretty interesting. They had, of course, Van Halen had other sort of crazy demands, but <laughs> this one was actually a, a good one. Um, and so. Yeah, having a trip to recognize the need that you need to make decisions. And there are other sort of tools that are com commonly invoked to deal with the decision-making process, like the pros and cons list. They talk about that for a while, and then that kind of recognizes that, yeah, I need to make a decision, but it's still subject to the common villains of just that decision-making. So at that point, they identify a process. They call it the RAP process, and it's, uh, it's people love our, our acronyms, right? <laughs> Widen uh, your options, reality test your assumptions, attain distance before deciding, and then preparing to be wrong about the future. Um, and so, as an example for widening your op options, they point out the, uh, with narrow fr frame, we tend to take decisions in the context of this or that, A or B, the very binary kind of mindset. Um, and so, one psychological notion for addressing this is, uh, opportunity cost. So if you're posed with purchasing something, you know, I want the Kia or the BMW, right? Well, BMW is really nice, right? But it becomes a question of like this or that. And they say, well, instead of saying that, well, if the BMW costs 60,000, the Kia costs 20, what could I do with that other $40,000? Could I buy the Kia and then what would I do on top of that? Um, another sort of approach to that is, uh, give me a second here. Oh, and they say, consider it in many cases, you can often, instead of being this or that, you can phrase it as this, and uh, there are many instances in which you can actually do both. Let's uh, then moving on to reality testing the assumption, your assumptions has to do with confirmation bias. And that's our tendency to collect some information, which all sounds like very well founded and scientific, but it's usually we're getting information that confirms what we already believe. Um, and so, in their example of dealing with that, they cited a publication by a judge to. Uh, law school students looking at joining firms. And they say, ask them, uh, instead of saying, you know, do you have any life outside of work, be very pointed about your questions. You know? uh, say, you know, how, how many times last week did you have dinner with your family? When was dinner ready? Did you work after work, dinner? You know? um, how many people were hired in the past five years? Are they still there? Can I still talk to them? Can I contact them somehow and you know, discuss why they left? Um, <clears throat> and then for attaining distance before deciding, uh, they say that you should pose this question to yourself. What would, uh, what, would our, what sort of advice would I offer to my friend? So in many cases, we struggle with our own sort of emotions about how we feel about something, whereas, you know, at least he asked me something, I'll be like, oh, you should just do this. It's, it's easy, right? <clears throat> um, and so their, their example for that uh, in business, the Intel in the 80s was struggling with whether or not they should end their memory line, because that was pretty much their core technology that they were founded on. Uh, but they were getting in a place where profits were dropping and their market share was declining because Japanese memory was becoming so good. Um, and they had also just developed a microprocessor, and they are like, well, we should keep this because it's part of who we are, but they were the only ones, and they got picked by IBM, IBM at that point for their microprocessor or the PC. 
seat. Um, so there's a lot of internal strife, fighting about what to do. This went on for years. And at some point, uh, they, the president and the CEO were sitting in that room, just sort of exhausted by this, how this has played out. And they said, if we got kicked out and the board brought in the new CEO, what do you think they would do? And the, the president turned and said, they get us out of memories. And they said, why don't we just walk out of the room, come back in and do it ourselves? So you, know, you see what sort of result that's had for Intel. Right? Um, preparing to be wrong is, is a more challenging uh, notion of decision making that is very difficult to counter. Um, you know, the sort of statements like the odds of a meltdown are one in 10,000 years for Chernobyl. Or uh, Decca Records in '62 passed up on the Beatles, saying, you know, "We don't like the sound of your band." Four-piece groups, in particular, guys and guitars are done. You know, but there's that level of conviction was so like solid, right? And then obviously they were wrong. <laughs> um, so. In order to counter that, they, they suggest that tripwires can help facilitate this process. Uh, Kodak, back in the 80s, actually did an assessment of digital photography. They were aware of it. Kodak themselves had originated out of uh, cutting edge technology. They developed color film when people were just using like uh, silver gel and clips. Right? And people thought, oh, well, nobody will ever use film. The quality's too poor, blah, blah, blah. And at the time when they did the assessment in the 80s, they said, ah, oh, digital photography is no good. There's no way people ever want to trade it that you know, for a picture. There's no way to really hold this. In the meantime, like over the course of the decades, technology evolved. What it meant to have a photograph of something, you know, cell phones and the internet changed everything. Right? But they never came back and looked at that. You know? And so instead of taking sort of a graded approach to that and saying, oh, well, we we'll have some action levels associated with this. Yeah, there's not a threat now, but if quality gets this good, or you know, some new technology comes to market that changes how people share photos, um, then you know, we should start looking at how we should uh, how we should address this threat. Um, and then, yeah, Kodak ended up going out of business in 2012, right? So, uh, so how this process relates to project management, I think it's 